Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the BeWell Texas Recovery Support Services Echo. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Shreya Prasanna, and I will be the facilitator for today's session. Before we get started, please note that we are recording these sessions for later distribution. Please note that anything listed in the chat does not appear in the recording. To help us with attendance, please enter your name, affiliation, and email into the chat function. To access the chat feature, click on the speech bubble icon on the navigation bar at the bottom of your window. To all the BeWell Texas providers, please make sure that you identify yourselves during the session, or if you're joining via phone, please email your phone number and name to bewelltx at yudhiska.eu. We appreciate your support in helping us fully capture this record. These sessions are enabled for live closed captioning. If you would like to view closed captioning, please navigate to the bottom of your Zoom window and select the show captions option. You may need to click on the three dots more menu at the bottom right of your Zoom screen to find this. If you have having trouble accessing captions, please message Echo IT. We love to see everyone's beautiful faces. So if you're comfortable and able, we encourage you all to join by video, especially for the discussion portion of our session. We encourage everyone to speak, but ask that you stay muted unless you're speaking. To mute and unmute, select the microphone icon on the bottom left of your screen. If you've joined on a computer or if you're joining by phone, please press star six. You can also use the chat feature to raise questions and comments. We want to hear from as many of you as possible, so please keep your comments brief to allow time for others to speak up. Please note that no protected health information is allowed in either the chat or the discussions. Uh, during and after the session, uh, our ECHO uh, IT support keto will send out a link to an evaluation of the session. All participants filling out the survey will be automatically entered into a raffle for a $30 Walmart gift card. Our didactic today is on Introduction to Assist, Saving Lives in Texas. Following that, we will be discussing a case from Etcada. We will start with introductions followed by didactics, announcements, case presentation, and an open discussion. Thank you all again for joining today. Um, Remember these sessions are what we make of them. We encourage you all to share your perspectives in today's conversation. With that, we'll do some introductions. Sean. Good afternoon, everyone. Sean Wright, uh, Program Director for RSS at Abilene Recovery Council and subject matter expert for the Hub Team. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Joseph. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Joseph uh, Sanchez. I am the Director of Programs with Faces and Voices of Recovery and also a subject matter expert with the Hub. Thank you so much for joining us. Richard. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, Richard Hamner with uh, Recovery Program Manager with Recovery Sports Services and Hub, a member for this ECHO. Welcome. Thank you so much. And Adrian. Hi everyone, Adrian Lindsay, Director for the Center for Substance Use Training and Telementoring here at BeWell Texas. Thanks. Thank you for joining us. Um, Bayan? Hi, my name is Bayan Blatney. I'm a recovery coach with uh, ACADA. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, is Dr. Kintai here? I just text her and she says she's trying to log in. Okay. Uh, so uh, we'll wait for her. I don't know if while she logs in, while we help her, while we help her to log in, we can uh, probably start with the case. Just as an exception, it looks like she's having some issues. All right. Uh, or we could do one thing. We could uh, maybe do the announcements. We could sure. yeah, we could go through the announcements so then we can have a continuity with the uh the didactics and the case. Okay. Uh Kato, if you could please uh, pull up the announcements. Thank you so much. BeWell Texas is a welcoming environment with caring professionals who are ready to help people start or continue their journey towards recovery. 
BVL Texas is committed to expanding equitable access to compassionate, evidence-based treatment and care for SUD throughout Texas. Next slide, please. Join us for the fifth annual Texas Substance Use Symposium, TXSUS, on March 27th and 28th here in San Antonio. This is a free event and includes a complimentary continuing education credits. For more information, visit txsus.org. Next slide. TexSUS Conference uh, is now uh, accepting exhibitor and sponsorship applications. The 100% of the support we receive provides a free continuing education symposium for all attendees, fund travel grants for experts in the field, and underwrite other event costs. To learn more, visit txsus.org, sponsored TXSUS. Next slide. Uh, join us for the next TXSUS session webinar featuring Dr. Sifan Curtis. To register, uh, please go to txsus.org sessions. Next slide, please. Our next RSS Echo is on Wednesday, February 22nd. Uh, we will have an interesting session, so please do join us then. Thank you so much. And it looks like our didactic presenter is still having some trouble. So we will uh, move on to the case, actually. Uh, Echo IT, uh, could you please bring it up? And uh, Bayan, please take it away. Hi. Yes. Um, this, like I said, my name is Bayan Blatney. I am a recovery coach with ACADA. Um, my participant is a 23-year-old white female. Uh, the participant has a traumatic brain injury resulting from a gunshot wound to the head. Um, she has been prescribed multiple medications, including oxycodone for pain. She feels she is misusing her medication by taking too much at a time and has stated that she has also bought medication off the streets. She wants to use less medication, but due to her TBI, she does not want to stop pain medication completely. Uh, some obstacles that we've encountered are um, her physical and mental, mental capabilities are limited. She suffers from trauma from being shot. She doesn't want to stop using medication pain medication, and it may possibly be unsafe for her due to the traumatic brain injury. Um, at this time, her recovery capital is low, and her goal right now is to, or at this time, was to keep a log of how much medication she is taking and how often she does. Um, she, has, she is also willing to start an IOP program and uh, she stated that some of her use is due to boredom. So uh, we discussed that she is going to start doing volunteer work with her mother's assistance and her and I would be checking into IOP programs that fit her needs. And um, also uh, the questions that I just um, would like to be addressed, um, any feedback would be wonderful. Um, uh, what programs could she be offered? Um, how can I keep her focused on her recovery and the positives of life? And any other suggestions that anyone has would be great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. And um, I will open up this uh, case for some discussion if you have any questions on the case. Yes, uh, Carrie. Well, in, in the way of boredom, 
like, are y'all doing a possibility? I know she's going to be doing some volunteer work, but along with that, do y'all do like with us, we go to heydays. We do fun and recovery social activities where they learn how to do different activities so it's not as boring for them. And they see that life can be different than just sitting at home. And because I get it, take it. Me, when I get bored, I don't, of course, use anymore, but there's other things that may not be the best for me that I've been known to do. So instead, I do other activities that are better for me. So that's a suggestion. Thank you so much. Um, Jordan. Yeah, um, thank you for presenting just a few questions. Um, so the first thing that comes to my mind is, is there any history of previous drug use? And if there is, like what kind and like, what did that drug use look like? Was it chaotic? Like, um, and as far as, you know, her health conditions and the pain medication, you know, I'd mentioned about her looking into IOP and like looking at, does she meet the criteria for IOP? So is that level of care appropriate for now? Um, you know, can she explore the option of working with a therapist who is knowledgeable in moderation management techniques um, that's well-versed in harm reduction? Um, I think the volunteering, getting into something that is tangible um, is a great thing for her to explore. Um, and aside from working with a peer specialist, like what other what does her support system look like outside of the peer specialist? This is Coach D. Um, uh, I would, um, I think that uh, her recovery capital is really, really well, that she has natural support and she's connected to the community. Uh, but my, my, my other concern, I mean, it sounds like she's out to a great part because it sounds like it's something that the peer wants to do. And so push up on, on you supporting what the peer wants to do. Uh, but has she, as her and a family member, her natural support been introduced to naloxone or Narcan? How to recognize, respond, and evaluate an overdose. That's the only thing missing from this here. Yes, actually, um, I'm sorry, uh, it was after um, this had been uh, submitted. Um, we did do a Narcan, um, provided her mother with Narcan and uh, also gave her training for that um, just last week, I believe. So they do have that on hand now. Yeah, great. And did you just, in? Um, you just, um, uh, monitor her dosage of services based on her engagement on what her plan is for herself and just have those other resources on hand if she decides that IOP is not enough and she want to go to another level or another system of care to get what she needs. You have those resources ready available, but it sounds like she's, you know, she's where she wants to be based on her plan. Good job. Thank you so much, Dee. And uh, Lindsay, you had some, had your hand up. Yeah, so um, I would, you know, first of all, I would commend her for, for coming to you with this problem. It sounds like she really is on top of things, which is awesome. Um, you know, not everybody is as, as open, you know, but I would also say that um, if she's not necessarily interested in like an IOP or can't attend an IOP, that there's also things like, um, um, the clubhouses, which are um, peer led or peer run organizations that are open from during the workday from like, you know, nine to five or whatever. And then they also do a lot of after work or sorry, after hours activities and things like that. It's really great for building a like a support network and like a social network because they do a lot of social events um, and they're completely free, which is always nice. <laughs> um, the other thing I would say is that, you know, if she's expressed that, then like having her um, have like maybe an accountability buddy or something like that would be helpful. Uh, preferably not you, because I, I tend to think that 
I separate my roles, right? I would never be somebody's accountability buddy because that's not my role. But I would, you know, if they need one, suggest that they find one, you know, in a some type of social setting, which also helps them kind of gain the the partnership and friendships in the community that they that might be beneficial as well. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Any other? Uh, I I do also see um, a question from Jordan. Um, if she has access to drug testing. I'm sorry, does she have access to? Drug checking. To, uh, I am not sh sure. Do you, do you mean as far as like a, to test her drug levels? Okay, yeah, it's, that's, um, I, uh, as far as I know, she doesn't. Bayan, I, I think, uh, and this is Joseph here, uh, excellent case. Uh, uh, reading it over, there's so many, many different possibilities, and we're hearing some awesome feedback from the group. I think um, uh, when we're talking about, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jordan, when we're talking about drug checking, um, if the participant is buying uh, substances off the street, that they have a way to check what they're buying to make sure that, you know, that's a, it's another preventative way from uh, overdose. Oh, you have mm -hmm. to verify the street drugs are real. Yeah, um, no, I did not know that was a thing. So I've learned something and I can uh, find out about that and certainly let her know because we have discussed that and she, you know, you know, she believes that the street drugs that she's getting, that they're total, you know, that she knows the guy that she's getting them from. Um, so we've discussed that, but I didn't know that was an option. And thank you very much. And I believe, I think there's uh, enough uh, coaches and peers on the call that they can probably direct you to some resources for fentanyl test strips and even uh, some test kits. In some places, it's not readily available and you can't really bill it to a grant. <laughs> and sometimes it's uh, considered illegal. But um, if it's going to save a life, uh, absolutely. Uh, getting them connected to that and something um, that as peers we should put in our back pocket. Yeah. Thank you. And and I'm there's a lot of interesting comments here in the chat. The only problem with drug checking that it's not instant, that you have to send them off. So that's a challenge, I guess. And uh yeah. So uh any other comments or questions if somebody would like to bring it up? All right. I'll, have, I'll ask another one just because I am also a chronic pain patient and a drug user. Um, so a lot of questions of like, what does her pain management team look like? Um, what's that wraparound service look like? Is she, is she working with a pain management doctor who's also an addiction specialist? Um, is she getting the right pain medication? Is it the right dosage? What kind of support is coming on the back end of that? Um, because as it was like reiterated a couple of times in the forum, she, at this time, like she doesn't want to cease her prescriptions, um, which is completely understandable. She has a traumatic brain injury and people with chronic pain shouldn't have to be forced off of their medication. Um, so I would really look at what does that pain management care team look like for her? And is she getting everything she needs on that end? Sean, I think you had a comment that you wanted to make. 
Yeah, I did. Uh, sorry, I was just going to wait and see if Bayan had a response to Jordan's <laughs> question first. Um, so you had mentioned on the document that recovery capital was low and outside of the things I um, enjoyed what Lindsay was saying earlier as far as some potential ways, you know, to increase or to decrease boredom and find some ways to uh, have, uh, you know, sense of purpose and connection and, and some ways to stay busy. But um, what areas of the recovery capital are low and would there be something to be said for finding ways to be preoccupied addressing those things, whether it's through the coaching or other community resources or, you know, whatever that might look like. I was just kind of curious more on the details of the recovery capital. Um, well, for her recovery capital, she does have somewhat a family support. Um, but it is not a strong family support. She does live with her family but um, they are not involved very much in her physical or uh, or much of her recovery. They're just there. Um, they kind of live in the same house. Um, and um, she is building up her recover her capital right now as far as um, going to groups. And she uh, is definitely in um I about now beyond pre-contemplation um and it's just it's been a slow start with her but um you know and giving her the choices I think uh it was a big key with this participant mm -hmm. and um I'm sorry. Also, with uh, Jordan, I was just writing down um, when you were talking. I did not. And she does, you know, of course, have pain management doctor, and uh, but I did not think to see about a pain management doctor that was also an addiction specialist. So that is something that, you know, I I definitely will discuss with her because I'm not sure if her doctor is. Uh, an addiction spe specialist along with that. So thank you very, very much um, for that comment. That helped a lot. Thank you. And um, Johnny. Yeah, um, I just, I wanna, and I'm, and I apologize if I missed it, if somebody addressed it, but um, I wanna circle back to the the boredom piece. Because I think you, I think in your presentation, you, somewhere in there, you said that part of why she thinks that she uh, takes her medication more than she should is is related to her being bored. And so, but I, I'm I'm curious about a couple of things, and I think one was already addressed because you said that she has family support, but it's kind of lukewarm, I guess you know, so to speak, and so. One, I wondered, um, were there some things that she enjoyed doing um, prior to sustaining her brain injury that maybe she's not uh, participating in so much now? Um, and two, um, in terms of the, the recovery capital outside of the family, um, does she have any other friends? Because I heard you say that you know she's she's connected, you know she's she's going to meetings, and she's doing other things that are recovery related. But um, what I've learned, and you know my what almost nine years now of of doing this job, is that you know peers, we're all peers, and so and we're all people, and we need we need more than just. Um, supports and socialization in the recovery context. We need support outside of that. So I wonder, I just wondered if she has, you know, friends outside of the recovery community um, that she can spend time with or enjoy spending time with or has enjoyed spending time with in the past, but maybe has just been disconnected from those persons if they were healthy, because I don't know what her, what her, her background was. Um, and if not, you know, um, is there anything that she can do to build that? And I ask because I'm currently working with someone right now who 
um, definitely needs a support system, doesn't really have friends or people that she can uh, enjoy life with. And so I'm trying to help her think through what that needs to look like for her so that she can begin to enjoy life again. And so I just kind of wondered um, if there's any conversations around that, like what uh, what can be done, you know, um, to help her uh, bridge that gap of being bored, to kind of fill in, to, to, to fill in the space, so to speak. Right, Th uh, thank you. Um, those are very good points. Um, and she does not have friends outside of um, our recovery community uh, right now. Um, and that is based on the trauma that she experienced from um, the gunshot wound. She actually moved to this area from another state, um, getting away from that environment. Um, so that is definitely. Uh, something that I, be I believe she'll probably need. She's definitely, uh, she has not started counseling, but we've discussed counseling for the trauma in her life. And um, along with counseling, um, that's great. She, hopefully she'll start branching out um, to getting more friends because she's still scared of people right now. Thank you. Um, did anybody have any a few final comments? There you go, Lindsay. Oh, I thought I didn't think about it, but also um, harm reduction works is a group that's virtually that I run virtually that is um, for people who are you know interested in in harm reduction and kind of talking about it and can be comfortable you know talking about usage and things like that. So she's always welcome to come to one of my groups. It's run um, every Wednesday night from eight to nine p.m. I'm sorry, what was the name of it or how can I, how can we get to that? Yeah, so I'll put it in the chat. It's also on my, on my background when I stop my video, but it's, uh, it's online, it's virtual. Thank you so much, Lindsay. I think in the interest of time, uh, this has been a great discussion. So we'll now uh, request uh, Joseph, if you could provide us a, a summary of all the recommendations. Yeah, uh, absolutely. <clears throat> great. A lot of great uh, feedback. I was uh, taking and jotting down uh, a lot of bit of notes. Looking at from a peer standpoint, we meet folks wherever they are in their process of recovery. And I think um, there's always a challenge of the individual, the participant, first off, identifying what that looks like. And uh, the the challenge that challenge has been met with uh, within your uh, description of your case here, <clears throat> when the person uh, personally identifies that hey I'm taking a little bit too much I need to keep an eye on that, so that's that's something that's something that we're able to work with, and not only two that they want to keep an eye on it, but there there's seems to be no interest in stopping that medication. Um, so it's keeping tabs on that. So a harm reduction kind of uh, approach to um, th their process and with uh, traumatic br uh, brain injuries and just uh, different abilities in general, there are a lot of different resources that people can tap into that they can learn more about uh, their diagnosis. And I think that there's there's areas for that that help to empower the individual and take ownership of um, instead of um, when we work with them telling us what they can't do. Um, we have opportunities for uh, growing uh, social recovery capital. If we can recall our um, dimensions, our, our recovery, uh, da, 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 um, SAMHSA's uh, dimensions of uh, recovery, we're we're looking at health, home, purpose, and and um, community. Their health, 
you know, how do they monitor their health? How are they checking and making sure that any kind of uh, substances that aren't prescribed are legit? Um, and it's not just based off of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I know the person, but legit, um, I'm making sure that they are uh, using safely. And there are a lot of harm reduction techniques. I, I believe Lindsay had mentioned getting somebody to kind of be their watch, uh, their using buddy, so to speak, just in case something were to happen and not only uh, informing the uh, family members of how to use uh, Narcan or Naloxone, but also uh, the participant and that participant's uh, using buddy. But there's also an opportunity to grow that uh, community um, with other folks that might be using as well um, and on a harm reduction pathway. So excellent resource. Uh, thank you, Lindsay, for throwing that out there. And I believe it's thrown up in chat. Yes, it's thrown up in chat as well. Harm reduction works. Uh, for someone that may be afraid of people, this interaction is one of the best ways or best things that has come out of our national pandemic, we're starting to see more and more people that may have uh, previously avoided uh, connecting with individuals and building community um, uh, physically, and, and now they're creating robust communities online. Um, and it's not just those support groups, but other, other groups as well that go above above and beyond uh, or outside the box of uh, just substance use and recovery support. It might be uh, reigniting some of those previous passions or hobbies, um, giving a person a sense of purpose and uh, connecting with the community online, whether that's online gaming like backgammon or I don't online game, but there's online games. <clears throat> building uh, up connections in that community or those communities as well. And uh, so health, home, uh, the home life, there's an opportunity to, you know, there's there's support there, obviously, for the family, uh, but to what extent? And um, with wraparound services, not only looking at um, the health aspect and the medication aspect, uh, but the pain management aspect, and also to any kind of uh, supportive counseling, because this participant experienced a traumatic event, and that's preventing them from connecting to others. And it could be preventing them from connecting to uh, their family. And, and that's an immediate support network where uh, could also benefit the uh, uplift of a supportive environment at home. And again, that that sense of purpose, uh, I think through those wraparound services and, and resources, they'll be able to see um, uh, what they can and can't do, and what they are capable of doing, and um, possibly get to a place of challenge in themselves to do a little bit more than volunteer work. Or, um, uh, you know, I, I've known a lot of people that have gone um off of disability, but short uh, after shortly, you know, easing themselves into a workforce and knowing what their capabilities are and getting comfortable and getting confident um, and being able to manage uh, their pain and speak into um, the, those moments where they're experiencing hard times. So there's a, a recovery path and it's long, uh, but there's hope. And that's what we do as peers is give a bit of hope. Thank you so much, uh, Joseph, for that awesome summary. And uh, just a quick reminder to folks out here, um, uh, there's been a lot of talk about harm reduction. Our next harm reduction echo session is actually next week uh, on Thursday, February 2nd. So uh, those of you who haven't been to our uh, harm reduction echo, please do join us and do check it out. It's it's a really awesome space. And with that, we'll now move on to our didactics. Uh, Dr. Kinta is here. And while Kino pulls up your slides, if you could please uh, introduce yourself to our uh, uh, community here. Well, yeah, I'm Monica Kintig, and I have, yes, I have a PhD. You can call me Dr. Kintig, but I think it just means mostly that I love 
I'm curious. I love going to school and I love the work that I do. Um, I work for myself, which is great right now. I don't make a lot of money being a licensed professional counselor because I do any kind of crisis work over the phone for free and most people want free. But I also know all of the different services in my county so I can support that a lot. My work around suicide now is both uh, voluntary in my community and also um, around what I do for training for an international company called Living Works. And so when I was asked to be a part of this, uh, the question came up uh, about the assist workshop that I do offer in my community, but I also train trainers to do the workshop. And so um, what, um, uh, what I do a lot of is supporting trainers, supporting um, people who want to use uh, different kinds of suicide intervention training. Um, I volunteer in my, in my uh, in Tarrant County, I am a part of the Suicide Awareness Coalition. So that's, you know, pre primary prevention, uh, educational prevention. We also have a loss team, uh, local outreach to survivors of suicide, which is for people who are bereaved by suicide. They've lost a family member, a very close friend. And we reach out to those lost members. Um, uh, those, our loss team, reaches out to people either at the scene of a suicide so the police can do their work and we work with the family uh, who, who are left. And we do follow up after uh, the week, we give them resources and things uh, to help them make sense of it all, have a place for open and direct talk, which I think is another kind of prevention because after the fact, um, it's important to have those opportunities to openly and directly talk about suicide. So um, then intervention is what I'm gonna talk about today. That is what we do when we find out someone has thoughts of suicide. What do we do? We all, many of us have had some kind of training um, about recognizing signs, I usually call them invitations, you know, things that make us think, mm, maybe I need to explore what's going on with this person. Maybe I need to ask about suicide. Um, and so what I'm gonna be talking about today is about intervention, not just recognizing signs, not just, um, you know, but this workshop that helps you figure out what to do after someone says yes. When you ask them that direct question, are you having thoughts of suicide? Are you having thoughts of that ending your life? Or, you know, what to do next? And I never got that training in graduate school. I got the training on the job. And sometimes it was good and sometimes it wasn't. And so I'll be talking more about that. So this is the, the beginning slide here. If you go to the next slide, it just it just highlights what I'm going to be talking about. Um, in terms of um, what assist is and why assist is important um, or some kind of suicide first aid training. The first point has to do with the fact that um, suicide is really a community health issue. It's not just a mental health issue because even though a high percentage of people who actually complete end their life by suicide. There are also people who end their life by suicide who might not have a mental health diagnosis. Sometimes it's, it can happen very fast in, as an acute stress situation. And I guess that's technically a DSM-5 diagnosis, acute stress disorder. But we think about depression, uh, for example, not all people who suicide are depressed and not all de and not all depressed people even think about suicide so we're not just dealing with mental health issues of anxiety suicide bipolar whatever kind of diagnosis we're thinking about um what i'm going to talk more about is this role of suicide first aid intervention and how that plays an important role in building suicide safer communities because we really can't 
keep people from having those thoughts. We can't be the thought police. What we can do is help people take those thoughts and their reason, their suicide story, why they think suicide might be an option for them. We can help them to find ways not to act on those thoughts. And what we do is we look for some little bit of uncertainty, some little bit of life, some little bit of doubt and build and support on that. Um, and then I'm gonna identify some of the ways that assist the assist workshop in particular meets the needs of all types of helpers, both professional and non-professional. So if we go to the next slide, it's um, it assist is a two day workshop. It's extremely interactive with lots of facilitation rather than lecture and lots of, of practice and interact. So only about 10 to 15% of the workshop is presentation like what I'm giving you right now. Um, you know, 80 to 90% of, well, no, I, that's not right. My numbers are wrong. Uh, 80 to 85% of it, it are really, um, it's, it's interactive. You don't just sit there. You have to participate to get the most out of it. Although nobody's required to participate, it's strongly encouraged. So we do a lot of balancing safety and making it safe enough for people to participate, interact, uh, practice the skills we teach, as well as um, uh, safe enough so that they can meet that challenge of even talking openly about suicide. We train people that are mental health professionals, but we also train other people outside of the mental health profession because the likelihood that someone is going to want to, um, is gonna wanna talk to the person that's closest to them or their friend is the probably one of the most important things that we need to pay attention to. Um, it's, um, we only train people that are 16 or older. So um, the next thing, I just in terms of focusing on it as a, the next slide talks about how suicide is a community health problem that affects all of us. So what you have pictured here, it's not the best picture, but it is an iceberg. And what we know about icebergs is that we only really see the tip. So for example, in 2020, um, the, you know, the tip of the iceberg that there is that there were about um, 45,000 plus suicides in the US. And that is about, um, a rate of 13.5 per 100,000. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. What we know is underneath the water where more information lies is that unreported suicides are five to 25% more. And these are unreported likely because maybe it's a one car accident. Maybe it's an overdose that we don't know if it was accidental or intentional. Um, we don't, if, and if the medical examiner can't determine whether it's a suicide, they won't list it as a, a death by suicide. We know that non-fatal suicide behaviors, depending on which research you look at, are 40 to 100 times greater. So our number is getting quite big now as we think about people who have suicide behaviors, taking those thoughts to action. I'm not talking about people who um, self-harm to cope with stress. I'm talking about people who are actually taking those thoughts to action because they feel so desperate, they have to act on those thoughts. They have to take those thoughts to action. Um, so sometimes, of course, self-harm behaviors, cutting and burning and different kinds of things, sometimes those things start out as a coping technique and end up actually as a suicide um, behavior. Um, and sometimes, you know, sometimes the behaviors are rehearsal until, 
they finally do it. And sometimes they're not connected to suicide at all. So we do have, we do have to pay attention to that. People with thoughts of suicide are about three to five percent of the uh, population. So that's about one in 20 people. About one in 20 people. So when you have thoughts of suicide in a given year, so think about the people that you're around on a regular basis. Um, one in 20 of them likely have had those thoughts. Now, sometimes people let go of those thoughts as soon as they come into their head. Sometimes people, um, but we need to have, we need to have lots of folks around that can intervene and offer suicide first aid. You're actually more likely to need to do suicide first aid than you are to have to do CPR because someone's had a heart attack. Um, we also know that people who are affected, people are affected by when someone they know dies by suicide, whether it's just someone they've heard about, like on the news, or maybe a famous person like Robin Williams, whether it's someone they actually know, an acquaintance close friend or family member, but people are affected by someone who dies by suicide. They have, it touches them. And it also, um, even if they just have suicide behaviors, everybody who's around that person also needs something. They need to be able to talk about it. They need to be able to, to um, know what to do, to feel more helpful, to feel more like they can be more a part of it. So if we look at the next slide, um, <clears throat> there are many ways that communities are affected. Um, the bereavement and pain of loved ones. There's a lot of expense when someone suicides or someone has behaviors, uh, suicide behaviors. There's medical expenses, there's lost wages. We have loss of morale in organizations where there's been a suicide. Um, and sometimes our fear of talking about it, that it's going to increase it, uh, increases stigma and taboo. So one of the things we need to do is reduce that with open and direct talk. I think open and direct talk and saying the word suicide and getting comfortable with it can be one of the best tools we can use. And ASSIST offers that space and that time for us to unpack our feelings, our attitudes about suicide. As a mental health professional, I, you know, I was taught to sit, take my, um, you know, my, my feelings, my emotions, my experiences, set them aside to be fully present for the person that I'm trying to help. However, we sometimes we need to be able to unpack those and look at them and see how those feelings, experiences, and attitudes influence what we do. We need to be able to talk openly about suicide. And as the assist workshop takes some time for everyone in the workshop to open to bring out those things, to talk about it openly, and to look at the impact maybe how your attitude, how your attitudes, beliefs, experiences might impact interact offering suicide first aid in a positive way, in a helpful way, or how sometimes our attitudes, beliefs, and experiences might impact someone in a not so helpful way. And so if we notice that, what do we do? What do we want to do differently? Maybe sometimes our attitudes suggest high guidance, lot of lead, lots of leadership with people. And other times our attitudes, beliefs, experiences suggest lower guidance. So there's a big discussion about that. So what can we do to help? Uh, we can try to prevent suicide. Suicide can be preventable and anyone can make a difference in helping someone get to a place of safety for now. So assist really it's not about therapy. 
it's not about solving all the problems that people bring to, although we let people when in the intervention, we let them talk about what's brought them to this idea that suicide is an option or for them seems like a good option, that that's what they're thinking. Um, we don't try to solve those problems. We don't try to fix it. We don't try to, you know, in one interaction, find the magic key. We really work in assist to help people recognize that maybe there is something, maybe there's a little bit of doubt. Maybe there's a little bit of uncertainty. Maybe there's just something they say like, if we say to them, seems like everything's headed towards suicide for you and what you're telling me right now and trying to understand that. And they say, yes, but when they someone says yes, but that's where all the life is. They don't even have to finish the sentence. It's about helping people recognize that when you said, but it made me think maybe there's a part of you that hasn't fully decided suicide is the answer. Since you haven't fully decided, would you be willing to work on some safety for now? Because maybe this feeling will pass. Getting them to agree to it. Because a lot of things that are out there skip over listening to their story, skip over helping them decide that, yeah, maybe I do have a little part of me that is not totally focused on death. Maybe there's something that I can do to be safe for now until I get past this desperate moment. And that's what assist teaches people. So people that are available to use it, it's like I say, it's, it's a community wide, let's look at the next slide, the co a community wide experience because on the next slide you can see who uses assist skills it's all it could be community members it can be counselors social workers clinicians crisis line workers all of the people on the national suicide lifeline 988 have been trained in assist um doctors nurses medical professionals faith communities um and i'll talk a minute about other uh, programs we have that work specifically with faith communities, firefighters, our, our first responders, military. I do this a lot of military installations, but almost anybody who's going to be in close proximity because most people don't share their thoughts of suicide for the first time in a mental health professional's office or even a peer, they might with a peer specialist, because that's peer-to-peer -peer interaction. But it's somebody who's close to them though. It's family, friends, a caring person. And that's the person who needs to be prepared to do the first aid. Um, just like we prepare everybody to do CPR, you know, makes sense that we'd want as many people as possible to know how to do first aid. So if we look at the next slide, this look at looks at Living Works is an international company and ASSIST is just one of their programs. It's kind of was the, the gold standard main program, but then we began to realize that not everybody in a community needs to be a suicide first aid caregiver. Sometimes we just need people that are willing to talk openly about it. Sometimes we need um, people that are safety starters. Sometimes we need safety connectors that get someone to someone who can do first aid. And then we need people who can do post-intervention after you've done that, that's safe for now. So if we look at the next slide, oh no. Yeah, I'm gonna skip the, what, what I was gonna say about, go back to the last slide. Um, at, if you go to livingworks.net, um, you can go through, there is a program on there that looks at building a, a continuum of support like you're seeing here. And it looks at what kinds of folks we need in our community to play different roles. Um, so there are, LivingWorks has several other programs, like I say, LivingWorks Start, Safe Talk, 
which are shorter than two day programs. The assist workshop is a two day workshop. And that's because there's lots of practice built in so that when you leave, you have practiced being a caregiver in a variety of ways, large groups, small groups, running simulations, um, all sorts of ways so that when you leave, you feel much more comfortable actually doing it. Um, and so I would encourage you to go to livingworks.net to look at these other programs, but also look at and think about what do you need? What role do you wanna play in a, in a community? And as a, as a person who does counseling and therapy, if someone talks about suicide in my session, I take off my counseling and therapy hat because those are often longer term goals I'm working with someone on. I move to, I put on my first aid hat and I'm looking at just safety for now. That longer term stuff isn't gonna be handled in one session, but I can help someone to be safe for now so that we have the time and space to work on the longer stuff. So now if we go to the next slide, I thought you might wanna know some about some of the outcomes. So um, the assist outcomes, um, people learn to understand better their own attitudes and beliefs and the impact that might have on your role as a caregiver uh, or a helper. To recognize someone with thoughts of suicide, step up and actually talk to them and, and try to understand their situation. I, I try never to say, oh, I absolutely understand because usually the next thing out of my mouth is gonna be, and here's why, because of my experiences and then it becomes all about me. But I do usually say, help me understand what you mean by this. Help me understand why suicide, why now? We also, the outcome is that we learn how to help a person with suicide thoughts find that turning point, that emotionally start charged moment when life seems to speak, when something about them changes and we help them stay safe for now. We also know that suicide first aid, much like um, being a lifeguard and offering CPR, it's not something you do alone or you, you, when you end, other people are involved. So um, I happen to be a widow, but the one morning when my husband, uh, you know, fell over and was that was making weird sounds, and I had to do chest compressions. I, I didn't do chest compressions until he revived, and that was done. We did nothing else. I I ran first, opened the front door, so the paramedics could get there. I had the nine one one operator on. I did the chest compressions until they came. And they could then, I, we got other people involved. You know, it was that immediate risk of death and safety for now is what I was able to do. It's the same with suicide first aid. And we get other people involved. But if we take the time to really listen to people and be there with them and get them to agree that they want to be safe for now, our care and support and respect for where they are right now and their story makes all the difference in creating for them a willingness to think about life, a willingness to think about the future and a willingness to think about being supported by other people. So, uh, Monica, yes. we're almost <laughs> getting close to time. So if you could please summarize in the next couple of minutes. Okay, so I just want to say that the last outcomes are it improves your caregiver skills. Let's just look at the last few slides. It will help people at risk. And I got some sources here if you wanna look those up later. And these are all studies that found it also is a cost-effective way to help. Um, so if there are any other questions I can answer about this, I could probably talk about it for three days. And right now I'm at a training for trainer in Baton Rouge. I'm training people to do the workshop. So I'm sticking this in in the middle of my training day. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I've been talking a lot, sorry. 
Thank you so much, uh, Monica. That was a great presentation and I wish we had more time, uh, but we are close to time. So we will um, end the session. Thank you all again for joining today's session. As a reminder to earn uh, continuing education credits, please complete a post-session survey using the link in the chat. Our next session is on Wednesday, February 22nd. Uh, if you have any questions for Monica, please do put them in the chat. We will definitely pass it on to her and we can get you some answers as well. And yeah, and my my um, email address is monica.kintig at livingworks.net. And feel free to send me some questions. I will be training the rest of this week, but I can I'll get back to you early next week. That would be amazing. If you could just drop your email on the chat, Monica, that would be wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you all again for joining today. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.